So we're continuing with the same notebook. Um, and uh, we passed the part where we uh, created reconstructions of the snow depth. And um, now we're going to look at things from a different angle. So if you think about it, um, if these three um, coefficients can reconstruct the, um, the original data, then in a very strong sense, these three coefficients are a good representation of the kind of year this station had in terms of snow depth. Okay, these three numbers are basically telling us uh, things about um, um, either how much snow there was, uh, whether the season was early or late, or whether the season um, was short or long. So to analyze uh, these things, to start to visualize them, uh, we're going to extract um, the parts that we're interested in, these coefficients, uh, into a pandas data frame. And then uh, pandas gives us a lot of ways to uh, visualize the data. So um, what we're doing here is basically selecting um, these particular um, uh, columns in the data frame. So station year, coefficient 1 to 3, residual 1 to 3, residual after the mean and the total variance. And then we're translating it into a pandas data frame. And um, and uh, then the columns of the pandas data frame is, uh, um, are, are these ones that we uh, generated. And um, we can basically start to uh, look at dependencies between different things. We're looking at our coefficient 3, and we want to relate it to years. So the simplest way to try to do that is using a scatter plot. OK, so um, um, we're going to do that. We're also going to limit ourselves to the years after 1950, because before 1950, there's uh, very few uh, measurements, there are very few stations that took measurements, so uh, the data is pretty sparse. And we prefer to use the parts of the data that are dense. So here is um, the uh, scatter plot that you can get for year versus coefficient. And it shows us, we can, it seems to show us that, yeah, there is quite a dif uh, difference between, um, between years in terms of uh, how much, uh, so like the year 1958 or so um, is this one. It seems that this coefficient was high, um, higher than the average for most stations. And then here it's lower and higher and lower and higher. So it changes. But the one thing that is kind of misleading about this figure is that if you look at uh, this region here or this region, the middle regions where there's a lot of the measurements fall right there, the measurements, uh, the, spot, the dots that correspond to the measurements are so dense that you really don't know how many dots there are. There might be um, many, many points here or fewer. You kind of expect that there are many because there's no points in other places. Um, but uh, you can't really see it directly from the graph. So that's a common problem with uh, big data because when you do scatter plots of big data, there might be regions of your scatter plot that are so dense that all you see is just uniform color. And you can't really say whether the density is high or low. So a different solution to doing it in this case um, is to use box plots. So I'm not going to explain here in detail. There's a pointer that you can go and, um, and study what are box plots. Basically, they tell you for each year, they tell you for each value of the year, what's the distribution of the um, values of the coefficient. So that looks more something like, like this. Okay, so what you see here is basically um, for, for this particular year, uh, this is the range between 25% of the data and 75% of the data. This is the median of the data. And then here it goes, I think, up to 5 and 95% and down to 5%. And then you have individual points that are outliers, that are outside of this range. OK, so you can, um, rather than, than worrying about how many exactly here, this gives you a very good sense about how many there are. And you can basically say, OK, well, 
um, in this year, 75% um, percent of, the, um, of the stations had, um, had a coefficient that is uh, larger than zero. And in this year, 75 had that was smaller than zero. So that starts to give you more statistical significance in terms of how, how much there is a variation between uh, years. So um, other things that we might be looking for are relationships between coefficients. So um, it is often a useful thing to uh, do a scatter plot of coefficient 1 versus coefficient 2 or coefficient 2 versus coefficient 3 because uh, these um, coefficients capture a lot of the, of the important state. And so the scatter plot will give us uh, hopefully information. Now, it's not always the case. Here is, here is uh, another typical case that we don't really get much information that is new. Um, this is the coefficient for uh, 1. So this is coefficient 1, that is essentially the amount of snow. And this is coefficient uh, 2, which is the, um, whether, the, whether the season is late or early. Okay? So what you see is that there is, like this, there is this boundary that goes more or less like this. And the reason for that is that um, the amount of snow um, cannot go too negative, right? Basically, it cannot, um, ha you cannot have negative snow depth. So the coefficient is not exactly snow depth, but it's very close to that. So if you have snow depth, uh, uh, the coefficient around value, this minus something like this, then um, you don't have any points to the right, uh, to the left, and then you have most of the points to the right. On the, uh, in addition to that, as you have more and more snow, the meaning of having early, uh, early snow versus late snow, the, 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 the amount of uh, this vector that you need to add or subtract is bigger, simply because uh, it's all just a linear combination of vectors. And so if the vector is big, you need to add large amount in order to change it. If the amount of snow that falls is very, very small, then a small amount of um, the second coefficient will move the season early or late. Okay, so that's what you basically see, that the, the first uh, coefficient is more or less the volume of snow, and the second one is a parameter whose range depends on the volume of the snow. And this is actually a very common kind of thing. Uh, you often get that the first coefficient represents something like the volume. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to look at uh, in this, in this uh, notebook is uh, basically the dependence um, of the number of coefficients that you use on the distribution of the residual. Okay, so we know that for every individual example, if you take it, um, then as you increase the number of coefficients, you get an error that is smaller and smaller. But we would like to get some kind of global view of how much overall does the, um, does the error decrease. I mean, another overview that we get is simply by the percentage of variance explained. So that gives us the expected value. But we want to see a little bit more than that. So here is how we do that. Um, what you see here is basically uh, cumulative distribution functions for the um, residual versus the fraction of the example. So the residual after just one eigenvector is this line here. And as you add more and more uh, coefficients, you get approximations that are better and better. So approximations that are better means that you're going towards the left. Okay, so after um, five, you would get um, this graph. And in between, you get the intervening uh, graphs. So that can tell you basically things like, um, well, if I want the residual to be uh, less than uh, 0.2, then um, if I use just one coefficient, I get uh, something like 0 0.03. And then if I get more and more, if I, if I use all uh, five eigenvectors, I get 0.03. 
that more than 0.2, more than 20% of my data points, um, the, the residual is uh, less than 0.2. Okay, so we kind of can get a sense of how good is our approximation using eigenvectors, not just on average, but in terms of a distribution. Okay, so to summarize, um, when we have a small number of top eigenvectors that explain most of the variance, uh, then we are inherently getting a low dimensional representation. And so um, this thing is quantified by the percentage of variance explained graphs or the graph that you just saw. And um, the low dimensional representation is extremely useful. Why is it useful? Because of a variety of things. And essentially, it gives you an insight into what is going on in your system. So um, it identifies the important degrees of freedom of the mechanism that is generating our data. Um, it uh, allows us to construct a good estimate of the raw data. So we can basically just forget the 365 numbers and just use maybe five or 10 numbers. Um, and from those, we can reconstruct uh, our original data very well. And even more than that, the part that we don't reconstruct well is probably noise. It's probably something we want to get rid of anyway. And um, um, once we have this representation using, instead of 365 numbers, just three or five numbers, then it is much easier to try to relate uh, those numbers that we uh, that represent the sequence to other uh, numbers that uh, are of interest, uh, such as the um, such as the latitude and longitude of the of the location, or the altitude, or distance from the ocean. Okay, so then it, it basically summarizes it for us what is in the graph, and we can start looking deeper in other dimensions. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.